everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We think we're, we're all set now, and I'm going to start with the conference. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our ADA compliance webinar and providing interpreters for the hearing impaired. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to get some housekeeping out of the way. A recording of our webinar, along with copies of the slides and a Q&A document, will be provided to all registrants, so even if uh, those who were not able to get on will get that. Um, also, we will have an archived version of the webinar available to anyone who was not able to register and attend. If you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat box. We will try to address them during the webinar, and if not, we will address them afterwards. We are really pleased to have Beth Christian. She's an attorney and shareholder at Giordano, Halloran, and Sesla here to speak about this important topic. Beth's practice is devoted to healthcare law and legal issues that healthcare professionals face. She has over 25 years of experience counseling clients on legal issues facing the modern healthcare community. She counsels clients and drafts policies regarding numerous patient care issues such as informed consent, advanced directives, patient transfer, HIPAA, and compliance issues. She is also the author of the New Jersey Healthcare Law Blog. It's a blog dedicated to providing federal and state healthcare news, laws, regulations, and upcoming events for the healthcare field. She is certified by the American Health Lawyers Association Alternate Dispute Resolution Service as a mediator. She's a member of the New Jersey State Bar Association Health and Hospital Law Section, the American Health Lawyers Association, and Burlington County Community Health Advisory Group. She has been recognized as a leading New Jersey healthcare lawyer by Chambers USA, America's Leading Lawyers for Business. She was named a New Jersey Super Lawyer for 2012 through 2015, and she received the Distinguished Service Award from the New Jersey Bar Association Health Law Section. I know her presentation is so full of information, so I'm going to let Beth get started. Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Melissa. I mean, Amanda and Melissa, and I hope everyone is able to hear me. Uh, again, my name is Beth Christian, and I'm going to be spending the next half hour, 40 minutes or so, uh, talking about uh, the provision of interpreters for hearing impaired patients. Uh, now, everybody uh, who is on this call knows um, physicians and other healthcare providers uh, practice in a very heavily regulated environment. and. Uh, now, right now, uh, you know, a lot of people have been uh, going to webinars and in-person presentations regarding uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, you know, the provision of uh, insurance uh, coverage to employees, you know, Starkin and a kickback, uh, tax, any one of a myriad of very broad topics. Uh, you might think that this topic that we're talking about today is, 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 is pretty narrow, and it, and it is, um, but one of the reasons I, uh, that the Medical Society wanted to uh, have this presentation is that they get an awful lot of questions about this topic, and so they thought it would be beneficial to the membership and um, others who wanted to join uh, to learn about uh, the area. There have been some really recent developments. We actually didn't plan it this way, but uh, the regulations under the Affordable Care Act, which become a uh, were published as we were working and fine-tuning uh, the final aspects of the webinar. So uh, I think that the webinar is pretty timely. Uh, we are hopefully going to meet two goals today for you. Number one, uh, we wanted to give you an overview of the law, um, but since the law can be pretty dry at times, um, we also are hoping to give you some practical tools that you can use in your practice as you move forward with this, the, the issues that pop, pop up. Uh, what you'll find in this area is there is a certain amount of uh, judgment calling that needs to be done, and you know, as we'll see, and we discuss some of the different scenarios that you might find yourself uh, in. Uh, so we hope that the the presentation is helpful to you. So I'm going to get started with the first slide, 
uh, when you can follow along with me. <clears throat> and so the first question that the medical society is often asked is a fundamental question. Is a physician practice required to provide an interpreter for a hearing impaired patient? Uh, and the answer to that is not black and white, actually. It, the answer is yes in some instances. Um, the um, provision of services to individuals with disabilities is governed by a number of different laws. Uh, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has been around for a long time, uh, which uh, provides that no individual will be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the full and equal enjoyment of goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation and the, uh, the, by any person who owns, leases, or operates a place of public accommodation. Now, a lot of people that are not familiar think that a place of public accommodation would be like a government office or a Target store or someplace like that, but it's actually <clears throat> much broader. And uh, I'm sure that all of you know this by now, but a physician's office is considered to be a place of public accommodation, and therefore a physician office would be subject to the requirements of the ADA. Um, there's also provision of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and as I uh, discussed before, there are regulations that become effective on July 18th of this year, which, which also uh, cover uh, the prohibition of discrimination on the basis of disability. And in New Jersey, because New Jersey always has to have its own laws, uh, on uh, these types of topics that we also have the New Jersey law against discrimination. Uh, so what types of assistance are, are you required to provide as a physician practice generally? And we'll get into some uh, more specifics later on. Uh, you're required to provide auxiliary aids and services, which may, it may include interpreters, it may not. Uh, to hearing impaired pers persons were, were necessary to ensure effective communication. And we'll get into a little bit of a discussion of what, about what effective communication means later on. Um, there is an exception under the regulations if there would be an undue burden on the practice. And so you might think, well, you know, to have a, an interpreter come in is an expense to my practice, therefore it's an, 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 an I'm not a, you know, a huge company like a Target. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I perceive it as a burden, but uh, what the government will do is look at your total gross revenues in determining whether or not it's a burden, and in most cases, uh, because of the revenues that are brought in by a physician practice, it's really very difficult to say that it is unduly burdensome. So, uh, unfortunately, if you feel it is, that it is a burden to your practice, um, you're going to have to show that there's an awful, you know, meet a, an awfully high dollar threshold when it, when measured against your total revenues. Uh, so this means that just about everyone has to has to comply and uh, make the service available. Uh, we're often, you know, uh, the medical society has been asked, uh, do you have to have somebody that has uh, American Sign Language certification? And the answer to that is me. Uh, that's all, you know, always a, a good option, but there are a lot of different uh, permutations, you know, does, uh, and we'll discuss those later on. Uh, I'll, I'll go into that in more, more depth. Uh, but certainly, you know, having someone that certification can be helpful, but if they, if they don't know health care, it may not be sufficient or it may not be appropriate in, the, in a given case. Um, so the next question is, on our next slide, uh, does the physician practice have to provide an in-person interpreter in all cases? And the answer is not necessarily, and it depends on the circumstances. And I think what, what, what we're finding is that there are um, a lot more uh, electronic types of uh, assistive devices that can be used of varying cost. and so. Uh, what we've uh, so you don't necessarily have to have somebody in person, but if you use technology, the technology has to work, uh, and the technology has to really be able to facilitate communication so that the patient can receive and also give information to you. So um, the ADA regulations have a whole list of, of different types of auxiliary aids, and you'll see one of them is note takers. Now, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but 
if it's a, um, you know, not a complex type of visit, in some instances, a note taker may be okay. Um, but in a lot of instances where you're providing medical information, a note taker is not going to be sufficient. So there's a whole host of different uh, types of uh, auxiliary aids that can be used to assist people with, with hearing impairments when uh, you want to communicate with them. Um, there's also, um, sorry, one, one second, we just had a little bit of, okay, uh, thank you, we just had a little bit of an issue with moving this slide forward. Uh, and I think I just skipped over one slide, my apologies. Okay, so the Affordable Care Act also has, and, and because the, those regulations are brand new, uh, they are a little bit more te uh, technologically advanced, so to speak, so they talk about things such as video, video remote interpreting and other types of uh, video, voice, and text communication, so uh, they may give you um, electronic uh, options that may be available uh, that were, were not referenced in the ADA regulations. Um, the question of who a qualified interpreter is, uh, is someone who can in interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially, and, and relay information, uh, both receive and give information. So it's equally important. Uh, the interpreter has to be able to understand what the hearing impaired person is trying to communicate to you as the uh, physician or um, other type of healthcare provider. And similarly, you have to be able to get that information to the hearing impaired person so that they understand it. It's not uh, simply enough to say, well, we've, we've provided the information back and forth, that's sufficient. It, there actually has to be an understanding by the hearing impaired person. Uh, of what you're telling them, and, and you've got to be able to understand, you know, clearly what are their signs and symptoms, uh, what are the issues they're coming to see, uh, coming in to talk about, um, you know, what are their questions, what are their fears and concerns. So uh, you've you've got to uh, be able to have that communication. That's that's really key. Um, American Sign Language is the most common type of. Uh, uh, service when you're, uh, or, or, or uh, certification when you're using an in-person interpreter. Uh, and um, American Sign Language is utilized by a number of hearing impaired person. And as you know, if you've seen people sign, it has its own specialized vocabulary uh, and, uh, you know, inflections and even, you know, certain, you know, jokes and other things. So, uh, you, you know, if you're using somebody with American Sign Language, um, uh, who, 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 an interpreter who uses uh, ASL, they have to be able to, to uh, utilize healthcare vocabulary. And, and we'll provide you with some resource, resources where you can find people that actually have that knowledge later on. Uh, now, there's also a question that's been raised. Um, does a certified interpreter have to be provided? You know, what, in order to get certification, people have to go to school and, and go through the certification process. Uh, so uh, the interpreter, again, as I said, ha you know, has to be able to understand and utilize the specialized, vo specialized vocabulary. So you, as a practice, you don't have to insist that somebody is certified. I think it's more important to know the, t the, the, the ways in which they would communicate with the hearing impaired person as well as their understanding of healthcare uh, vocabulary, you know, ask them, you know, how many times have you gone to a physician office or to a medical facility uh, to assist someone with a hearing impairment? If they say we, we've never done that before, or uh, then you know that's probably going to be an issue. Um, but you know, alternatively, if they say, well, I've never done it, but I've you know I've actually studied uh, the, the healthcare specific vocabulary and, I, and I'm able to, uh, to translate it, then I think that would be okay. Um, then we get into the, uh, uh, another permutation, which is uh, what happens if um, a patient uh, is uh, hearing impaired uh, and has a, has a companion accompany them, uh, or the patient say the patient is a child and their mom or dad or the person taking care of them 
uh, might be hearing impaired and, and uh, unable to communicate through, through speech and hearing? Do you have to provide an interpreter for the companion? And the answer is yes. If the uh, individual patient, even if they themselves have the ability to hear, uh, need the assistance of that companion in order to be able to communicate with you or in order to be able to understand what you're telling them, or if it's a case of a parent of a minor, uh, then yes, you're going to have to get an interpreter or another uh, for, for the companion or another type of assistive device in order for you be, to be able to communicate effectively with the companion and to comply with the requirements of the ADA and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, okay, then here's the question that everybody always wants to have answered. If I pro, if I uh, uh, I'm going to arrange for the interpreter and allow for the interpreter in the office, uh, does my practice have to pay for it? Uh, yes, you do generally, and as we discussed before, uh, it's uh, in order for you not to have to pay for it. Uh, you've got to show that there's an undue burden, and it's uh, very difficult in most instances for practices to do that. Uh, it, 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 again, it's uh, the undue burden analysis is tied to your gross revenues of the practice, um, not what you're going to be uh, earning based upon the services that you provide to that individual patient. Uh, if a patient, though, shows up at the office and with, it, with an interpreter and you've not agreed to pay for the interpreter, you don't automatically have to agree to pay for the interpreter. If you make an independent determination that an interpreter is not really needed for the patient, uh, that uh, you, then you can say to the patient, look, I think we're able to communicate without the services of the interpreter. You're welcome to have them be here, but uh, you know it, it, we don't feel it's necessary. But I think that's kind of a slippery slope because if you don't agree uh, to pay for the service, uh, you know, the patient can then file a complaint with the Department of Justice or can initiate litigation against the practice. Uh, so, you know, you, you really want to think about whether you want to reject somebody's uh, efforts to bring an interpreter uh, if, uh, you know, if, if, they, if they bring them along, along to the appointment. You may just, you know, it may be the, the safer and more compassionate uh, course of action to say, well, okay, we will, uh, we will cover the cost. And I'll get into cancellations a little bit later. Um, there are potential tax incentives available for the provision of auxiliary aids to hearing impaired persons, which we'll talk about on, on the next slide. Uh, under certain circumstances, if a specific minimal level of, ex of expenditures is reached and the practice revenues and the number of employees of the practice fall below a certain threshold. Uh, so uh, the first and most important thing, I think, is to understand that uh, w what you're getting is a, a disabled access credit, uh, which is provided to eligible small businesses. So a credit is a good thing. You know, it's more favorable, a little bit more favorable than a deduction. Uh, but um, there are limits. First of all, um, a small business, in order to be able to take advantage of the credit, business has to have earned $1 million or less uh, in a calendar year, uh, and that's gross revenues, so that's before you net out your employee and, and physician salary and, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, vaccine, vaccine and, and rent and all the other costs that you have. Uh, so, in a lot of cases, physician practices, if they've got more than, you know, one, two, three physicians in the practice, they're going to fall outside of the tax credit um, availability because their practice revenues are too high to take advantage of it. Uh, in addition, uh, you can't have more than 30, 30 full-time employees in a, in a prior year. Well, in most instances, if a practice has more than 30 employees, they're going to have more than a million dollars in gross revenue. Um, but if you fit within the test, you can claim the credit every year. Uh, there is a, sorry, I had an issue with the slides again. Uh, there is an, an 
uh, an initial uh, expenditure threshold, so you've got to spend at least $250 a year on uh, the provision of interpreter services uh, before you can get the credit. And then the credit itself, um, there's a maximum of, of $10,000 in expenditures uh, for, uh, for uh, interpreter services and other auxiliary aids. So if you go out and purchase equipment, uh, then you, know, you can also use the credit for that. But um, it's 50% of the eligible access expenditures in a year. So, uh, and the max is, is $10,000 of expenditures, so 50% of that would be $5,000. Um, I put a link in the, in the materials to the IRS form, so you're welcome to take a look at that and see uh, if it might be helpful to you. And certainly, if it's available to you, we take advantage of the credit. Then we get into some other practicalities. Um, where can I, you know, a lot of cases a physician practice may not know how to find an interpreter or another type of service uh, to assist their hearing impaired patients. And actually, uh, there is a division of, of, of uh, and, sorry, we have a typo, division of the deaf, and it should be deaf instead of deaf, hard of hearing um, f uh, through the U New Jersey Department of Human Services. And they actually have a very helpful online list of sign language interpreters, and there is a healthcare specific list. So you can go to that list, and it is, uh, I believe it is, is set up via geography. I've included a link in the slides, and so you can go on, on that list and try to uh, see if you can find someone who would be able to come to your office if a patient requests the services of an interpreter. Uh, there's also a separate list uh, on the website, and it's, it's a list of CART which is Communication Access Real-Time Translation Reporters. They, they function uh, as court reporters, and so they come in and they've got a, a, a particular type of machine that, that records the information and provides uh, a verbatim transcript. And so that's a, there's a whole other list of people that will um, are available for available service. Uh, we just had a question, will we get a copy of uh, these slides? And yes, you, I think may, perhaps you might have joined a few minutes into the call. Uh, we are going to make the slides and a recording of the webinar available afterwards. So if you missed any of it, you can go back and take a look. And yeah, hopefully the, the, link in the, the links in the slides will be helpful uh, for you. Uh, then we get the, the question sometimes, will the patient's health insurer cover the cost of the interpreter service? Uh, that depends. There may or may not be coverage available, and so uh, what we suggest is that you, if you have uh, folks coming in that need the services of an interpreter or other auxiliary aids, that you reach out to their insurer and ask whether or not that they have uh, a payment mechanism. Uh, for that. I can tell you that Medicare does not p provide reimbursement for the services of interpreters. Um, I looked around a little bit on the internet to see whether or not uh, any of the other payers had any mention of this. And uh, the member handbook for um, Horizon New Jersey Health, which covers uh, New Jersey family care, uh, says that Horizon can arrange for an interpreter to accompany an individual to a doctor's office. Uh, the member handbook doesn't specify whether or not they will pay for that service, but I would certainly, you know, Horizon is one of our biggest payers in New Jersey, and so uh, if you uh, have patients uh, covered by Horizon and you find that there is a need for interpreter services, I would definitely reach out to Horizon and ask them that question, as well as uh, the other payers other than Medicare. Uh, sometimes people want to know whether or not that they can use uh, whether or not they can use office staff uh, to provide interpreter services. Uh, again, this kind of depends. Uh, you, it's usually it, you know it's inadvisable unless you have somebody that is used to providing interpret, uh, interpretive services if they are certified certainly through a, uh, as an ASL interpreter and know the health specialized healthcare vocabulary, then yeah, you could certainly could use a member of your staff. If you have a large volume of, of folks coming in that need interpreters, it may even be worth uh, getting somebody, and your practice is large enough, it may even be worth getting somebody certified. 
but in the normal course, except in you know limited circumstances that we'll discuss a little bit later on, uh, it, it's probably inadvisable. Uh, and again, the, the the ACA regulations that are coming into uh, in effect next next month uh, talk about ha uh, the type of uh, of um, uh, qu uh, qualifications that a qualified interpreter has has to have. So. Uh, I would take a look at those. Um, and uh, there's a difference between, it's, it's probably kind of a subtle thing that you might not have thought before. Um, people have asked, uh, can a physician practice use a staff member who signs pretty well? Uh, and again, uh, it, 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 it's not enough to say, well, they, they sort of can sign, you know, they've learned a little bit of sign language. Perhaps on their, you know, on uh, on their own. I mean, YouTube is a great thing. We can learn we can learn lots of things on YouTube. But um, you know, if they don't have the specialized vocabulary and be able to uh, interpret both for the individual hearing impaired patient and for you, then it's not going to be very useful, and uh, you might get yourself into some difficulty with the Department of Just Justice or with the HHS Office of Civil Rights. Um, those are the two, by the way, those are the two federally, federal agencies that uh, will, where patients can uh, file complaints or where they may do an investigation of your practice and you'll see later on that there have been some practices that have had to enter into consent orders uh, with these government agencies for failing to, failure to provide an interpreter. Now, sometimes uh, you might think that a way to handle the, the uh, need for an interpreter would be to request that an individual patient bring a family member with them, uh, but under the law, you cannot require the practice to bring someone, a family member or otherwise, to interpret for him and her in lieu of you going out and, and paying for the service. Uh, you can certainly, in some circumstances, though, uh, allow a companion to interpret on behalf of the, the hearing impaired patients in a couple of instances. First of all, if you've got an emergency involving an imminent threat to the safety or welfare of, it, or of an individual or the public, um, and you know, this week's news, we're seeing far too many situations of people uh, being uh, getting in harm's way and, and the public. Uh, you know, pu public safety issues uh, arising and, and hospitals being overwhelmed with people who have been hurt. Uh, but um, you can, in an emergency situation, use a, 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 another family member, even a child. So if it is an emergency and you'd be putting the, the patient at risk or uh, the public at risk uh, by the failure, to, uh, by otherwise not having the ability to, to communicate with the hearing impaired person, then yes, you can use the, chi the child of the patient or another family member. Uh, in addition, uh, in uh, situations that are not emergency situations, you can uh, give the patient, if they wish, the choice to bring a family member. Some patients who are hearing impaired are perfectly happy to have a family member come in and interpret for them. Uh, you can do so if the patient requests it. So they should be the one initiating the request to have the family member interpret. Uh, if you suggest it to them or suggest that you won't see them unless they bring a family member, that's potentially going to get you into hot water. Um, in addition, you've got to get the consent of the accompanying adult. Um, you know, the, 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 the family member has to be willing to agree, and also it needs to be appropriate under the circumstances of the, of the individual's appointment. Um, and in the case where the patient voluntarily elects to have an interpreter, it cannot be a child, a minor child, so it can't be anybody under the age of 18. Um, and you've got to be sensitive to the situation. So let me know when I okay okay thank you everyone for their pa uh, for your pa of technical difficulty so we were talking about the situation where a family member would come in and interpret um, and what you have to also keep in mind is is that in a given situation even if the patient requests it it may not be appropriate um, for example if if you're giving the patient a really bad diagnosis 
you may want to talk to the, the, the family member privately before you have to communicate that to make sure that they are comfortable giving that information. You know, it may be very upsetting to the family member as well, uh, or if they otherwise have a personal stake in the outcome. Maybe, you know, I think of a situation where you have a, a mom that's undergone a BRCA test to see whether or not she's got the breast cancer gene, and she brings along her daughter who's, who's in her 20s and may undergo testing a little bit later on. Well, you know, that, that daughter, you know, certainly might find it very upsetting to, uh, to have to communicate that and realize that she, she herself might be carrying the gene. So uh, just keep that in mind in making the judgment calls to whether or not the family member is appropriate. Uh, also keep in mind that, you know, the family member needs to be able to communicate not only what the, the patient is experiencing and what their signs and symptoms are, but needs to be able to communicate back with the specialized vocabulary uh, that, you know, of, of, of medicine uh, and healthcare that you're trying to communicate to the patient. Uh, for example, <clears throat> and, and uh, this works with note-taking as well. Um, if the patient comes in and they're getting a routine blood draw, maybe you're testing allergies or medication levels or whatever, and they're coming every, in every week for that, or they're coming in for a TB test, uh, something that's fairly routine, then you, know, you may be able to use the family member. Or alternatively, if the patient doesn't request an interpreter, um, but you feel that there's a need for, for them to have an auxiliary aid, then note-taking, you know, giving a note to the patient and having the patient uh, give a note back to you in those situations where they're just coming in for a blood test, that might be sufficient. But if it's anything more complex, uh, then you're going to have to look for other types of auxiliary aids and in some cases may not be able to use the family member. Um, so uh, the Medical Society has also been asked, does a physician practice have to treat hearing impaired patients if not equipped to provide interpreter services? And the answer to that, as we've discussed, is yes. And not only that, but if you have uh, 15 or more uh, employees in your practice, you have to, not, you know, everyone who operates a physician practice has to provide service, uh, the, the interpreter services if, or other auxiliary aids if they are needed. Um, but if you have 15 or more employees, you have, actually have to have a, uh, disability grievance coordinator who can handle patient grievances uh, if patients are dissatisfied with the efforts of the practice to provide auxiliary aids. Uh, so that's, it. that's a very recent development in the ACA regulations. And you'll see at the end of the outline, at the end of the materials that um, I created, based upon the, uh, the language and the regulations, I've actually created a sample on notice for you to use in, 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 in your office. Uh, but if you have 15 or more uh, employees or, or if there are less than 15. Uh, because there is also a notice requirement. You've got to post a notice in your office about the, the uh, ability of the patient to make a complaint if they're dissatisfied with the provision of assistance for their disability. Uh, now, because of the in advancements of technology, uh, the Medical Society has been asked, may a physician practice use an interpreter service via the internet and video chat? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can in appropriate circumstances. Uh, there are a couple of different types of services. Um, one is a video relay service, which is used um, uh, to contact a remote interpreter. And, and uh, it, it is used for people who have um, who use sign language and have video phones, smartphones, or computers with, a video, with video communication capabilities. Uh, so that's one type of service is video relay. A second type of service that is available is called uh, VRI, and that's video remote mode interpreting where we actually have an interpreter. Uh, it's kind of like Skyping, I guess. You are uh, accessing an off-site interpreter to provide real-time sign language uh, or oral interpreting services uh, for conversations between hearing people and people who are deaf or ha who have hearing loss. Uh, and so um, 
that is certainly uh, an option. And I was actually amazed when I was doing the uh, research to put this presentation together, looking for resources that, that we could offer to you. I, I was amazed at the number of Google hits I got when I typed in the words of, you know, the, the acronym VRS for hearing, hearing impaired and VRI for hearing impaired. And there's also a wide variation in costs. So that might be an avenue for you, for you to look into. Um, the use of video technology is not appropriate in all cases. For example, um, if you have a hearing impaired person that also has vis vision loss and they can't read what's on the screen, then you will not be able to uh, utilize a video service. Um, or if it's someone that because of their other disabilities or just their stature, they can't be positioned in a, in a way where they can see the screen, then you can't use a video relay service. But it, it certainly may be worth investigating. Uh, in lieu of having an in-person. It, it might be something that also that you can get more quickly. I have heard, though, that, you know, that in, some, in some instances involving the video services, you have to go out and buy equipment, and so that would be an upfront cost for the practice. Uh, and then I've, I'm not going to go through the criteria for VRI, but there are specific criteria in the uh, Affordable Care Act regulations which, which talk about what you have to be able to uh, uh, the criteria that have to be met for VRI in order for VRI to be used, and that includes a training of your staff. Um, the Medical Society has also been asked, can a practice bill the patient for an interpreter if the interpreter shows up for the appointment but the patient does not show up? Uh, no, you can't. Uh, the Department of Justice guidance indicates that the patient, uh, if, the, if the interpreter shows up and there's a cancellation by the patient, you can pass along the interpreter's cancellation fee to the patient, uh, but what you can do is if your practice normally has a cancellation or a no-show fee for patients, uh, and, you, and they are for all patients, not for hearing only for hearing impaired patients who fail to show up uh, for their appointment with, accompanied by an interpreter, then yes, you can charge the patient the, the normal no-show that you would charge to any patient because in that case you're not discriminating on the basis of their disability, you are uh, charging them a fee that you charge to any other patient. And again, I think we talked about this already, um, you can use other types of auxiliary aids such as you know, note-taking in certain circumstances, uh, but not in the cases that are uh, situations involving the, the uh, relay of more um, complex information. There's actually a list that I pulled out of one of the Department of uh, Justice issuances which go through uh, situations in which an interpreter may be required in a hospital setting. I'm not going to read through all of those in the interest of time, but they will be available on the outline. Uh, and you know what, it, it, I think they're equally applicable to a, a physician practice. You know, things like informed consent, um, symptoms, just discussing symptoms, medical condition, test treatment, next steps, medication, surgery, et cetera. Uh, there, there is a you know, fairly lengthy list uh, that uh, the Department of Justice provided for hospitals, and I think it will, in many instances, work just as well for physician practices. Um, um, I went through a few representative cases so that you can see uh, how people have uh, gotten themselves into difficulty for failure to comply with the law. Uh, we actually had a fairly recent case in New Jersey. I don't know how it was ultimately resolved, but uh, it was a case involving a hearing impaired patient who sued an orthopedic group and a surgery center uh, alleged that, they, uh, that um, the staff communicated with the patient. This is why the handwritten note issue gets a little bit of, to be a slippery slope because the staff communicated with the patient with notes uh, rather than, uh, and actually denied a request for an interpreter. Uh, in this case, the patient was accompanied by her mother and a friend to all medical appointments, but um, uh, her, the patient's mother didn't sign, so she couldn't communicate with the patient via, via sign language. And the friend was also hearing impaired, so uh, the, she, the patient claimed that these individuals were not effective to serve as interpreters, um, I don't know what the ultimate outcome of the case is because um, there, was an, there was initially a motion to dismiss the litigation filed by the practice and the surgery center, uh, but uh, the court denied the motion to, dis to dismiss. So that, what that tells us is that the court found that there was at least facially 
um, a valid complaint by the patient, and uh, you know, I don't know how that, that case was ultimately resolved. It might have very well have settled uh, after the initial motion to dismiss was filed, or it may still be going on, uh, not sure. Uh, and it seems to be a little bit of a theme, unfortunately, with orthopedic practices. There was a settlement with the Office of Civil, Civil Rights of, the US, uh, of, of HHS, the, the folks that bring us Medicare and Medicaid, also uh, have oversight over this area of disability And so uh, there was a settlement with the um, uh, Orthopedic Institute of, of Pennsylvania uh, where there was a uh, denial of a sign language interpreter uh, when a patient called to schedule an appointment. Uh, and uh, actually at the end of the outline I have a link where you can look at some of the uh, consent orders or, or the summaries of the, the consent orders, at least, to see what they, they say. Um, also, there were a couple of, just so you know that it's not just for, you know, surgery center facilities and larger orthopedic practices, there were a couple of individuals out in Michigan who were uh, found to be uh, not providing uh, appropriate auxiliary aids, and they had to enter into consent. Uh, uh, settlements with the Department of Justice, which also has oversight over uh, disability discrimination. Uh, and um, here's the situation. Also, there was a, a case involving uh, the Center for Orthopedic and Sports Medicine. Not sure where they were located, but uh, the patient requested an interpreter for medical and physical therapy appointments, and the practice said to the patient, patient, it's your responsibility to provide an interpreter, not our responsibility, and that got them into trouble. So again, you, ca you can't uh, require the patient to bring their own interpreter. You have to make the interpreter available uh, unless the patient requests the opportunity uh, to, let's say, you know, bring a family member to interpret for them, and it's appropriate under the circumstances we discussed earlier. Uh, and again, there's another case involving a denial uh, of, uh, by, uh, in, uh, by Northern Ohio Medical Specialist, and they cited company policy, whatever that, that is, and they said we don't have to provide an interpreter uh, to you. So uh, other uh, ADA-related settlements uh, can be found at the link in the, in the outline. Uh, they are, uh, you know, there's a broader range certainly, but they are pretty instructive when they see the types of issues that can come up for various types of businesses, and so uh, they would be uh, worth, uh, 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 worth a look uh, if you want to see how others have gotten into difficulty. Uh, so again, as I said at the end of the outline, we've got a sample notice uh, which informs individuals about non-discrimination and ex accessibility requirements. Uh, we've got one for 15 or more employees, and then we've got also a separate one uh, for 14 or fewer employees. Um, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of our time here. I did hear that we had a couple of people that had, had to hop off early, and I'm sure the rest of you have to get back to the important work that you do in, in taking care of patients. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, sign off, and again, as Amanda and Melissa said we are going to have the materials available to you to access uh, both in audio recorded form or in um, and in written form so that you can refer to the not only to the outline but to the ink uh, the, the links in the outline with the resources so thank you very much for your time and uh, have a good day everyone thank you so much Beth uh it was a really comprehensive presentation, and we think it will be really helpful for, for our members to have it as an archive. So I really appreciate your time and everyone's time and patience today with our network connectivity issues. I, I hope it wasn't too disruptive to the webinar. So uh, thank you to everyone, and have a nice afternoon.